I'm going to resume. Uh, yeah. All right. I myself. Yeah, I see record, recording is on. Okay. And now I'm 6.58. Give it another minute. <clears throat> and, you know, uh, just so we know, worst case scenario, we will, um, if something happens with the connection, you know, something unanticipated, what we'll do is just have you proceed with the lecture because right. we'll be recording and then we'll just uh, stream it live uh, tomorrow. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Then there's no loss of. Um, right. Yeah. Period. Yeah. So, yeah. So we're, we're, you know, we're just, you know, we're just rolling. Yep. Exactly. Right. That sounds fine. Okay. Thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. It's a great, let me tell you, it's, uh, I miss, I miss being on the road and uh, I miss meeting and interacting with audiences. So you, you're at least giving me a, um, a visceral experience. Ooh, good. Good. So. All right. I'm going to hit the button. See what happens. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the National Museum of Industrial History's 2020 Virtual Gala Celebration, honoring PPL with the Annual Spirit of Innovation Award. I wanted to give a special thanks to our gala sponsors. You see them here on our screen. We appreciate their generosity. Uh, we have a lot of great events and activities planned throughout this week. And I hope that you can take advantage of our luxury raffle and our online auction. Uh, you can go to the NMIH web page and click on the support tab to find out more details on our annual gala. Um, but without further ado, I am very pleased to welcome Professor W. Bernard Carlson. Um, Professor Carlson is a historian of technology who studies the careers of inventors and entrepreneurs in order to educate future engineering leaders. In addition to serving as chair of the Engineering and Society Department at the University of Virginia, he directs UVA's engineering entrepreneurship and business programs, which help students develop ideas into ventures through coursework and co-curricular activities. 
Professor Carlson studied history and physics as an undergrad at Holy Cross College, received his PhD in the history and sociology of science from the University of Pennsylvania, and completed postdoc work at the Harvard Business School. His biography of Tesla, Tesla, inventor of the electrical age, has been translated into 10 languages. Um, that book is available for purchase through Princeton University Press and many other booksellers. Uh, without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Professor Carlson, who's gonna take over the lecture. Welcome. Thank you, Megan, and uh, thanks to the uh, National Museum of Industrial History for uh, uh, inviting me to do this, as I was saying in the, uh, in the lead up to this. Um, I miss being out on the road and doing lectures and meeting all sorts of different people, and so I really wish that I could be with you, you folks in Bethlehem celebrating your, your 2020 uh, gala. Uh, I feel a couple of kinship ways to the museum. One is when I was at the uh, Smithsonian Institution as a, a pre-doctoral fellow in the 80s, uh, one of my favorite things was to go across from the National Museum of American History to the Arts and Industry Building and look at uh, the centennial collections that are the core of your museum. And um, I had many... Uh, Many a pleasant day uh, poking around in the old A, old a and I building, looking at um, at the cordless engine and um, and various other things. I think also uh, I'm gl very glad to be here uh, talking to you guys because we share a common purpose. Uh, my tagline on my email says, "Using yesterday's technologies to solve tomorrow's problems today." And indeed, I think it's really important to be talking about inventors and entrepreneurs in order to engage the next generation of folks. And, and I feel very lucky in my career that now I am in the business of trying to prepare engineers and entrepreneurs to be the change agents for the 21st century. And it's, it's clear that one of the parts of your museum is to achieve those sorts of things. So through the magic of technology, I'm going to now share my screen and uh, shift over. Uh, I've got some slides to show you tonight uh, as we talk about Mr. Tesla's uh, remarkable career and it, it had a very distinct rise and, and an equally interesting um, denouement. And, uh, and part of what I want to talk about tonight is, is the ups and downs of his career and, um, and you know, what, what we can learn from that. How can he, how can he help us better understand uh, the world of innovation and the future of uh, technology? So lots of people sort of say, you know, biographies are dead. Who cares about biographies? They're, they're, they're big fat books and, you know, nobody really wants to read them. And the answer is, is, is this as much to my uh, delight and surprise when I brought this book out in 2013, uh, lots of people actually want to read about inventors and, 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 and know their, their stories and their careers. And, uh, and so it's been a big delight. But more, more importantly to me, what, what's the, you know, why invest as I did 15 years studying one individual? And, uh, and I'm pushing back on one big idea is, is that it's very easy for us to sort of say, ah, technology. It's pretty much shaped by, you know, large impersonal forces like science and the marketplace. And my, my response is, is no. The, the course of technology, the exact design that it takes, the timing of, of new devices and new systems are very much shaped by the decisions and actions of individuals. And this is more than ever true for disruptive technology. So what do I mean by a disruptive technology? I mean new inventions, new innovations that alter the status quo of the economy and dramatically change daily life. Think of the airplane by the Wright brothers. Think about the integrated circuit that's at the heart of the electronics that we enjoy every day in our computers and our, our, our Game Boys, our, our, our entertainment systems, and indeed, of course, our cell phones. And those disruptive technologies, more often than not, start with a glimmer of an idea that's in the mind of a single individual. And Tesla exemplifies that. So why study Tesla? Why, why is he so special? Um, he's, he's sure, you know, there was a band when I was in, well, I was in college called Tesla. There's, there is a movie that just came out 10 days ago about Tesla. So he's, he's clearly popular, but let's talk about him in a serious way for a moment. We'll talk about him in a less serious way in the next slide. Um, Tesla's an important fellow because he did develop two, not one, but two 
major disruptive technologies, and I'll tell you more about those tonight. One is the alternating current motor, which we find everywhere. It's in, it's in your refrigerator, it's in your air conditioner, it's in your elevators, it's in machine tools. It's the basic building block of, of, the, of our industrial society. The other one that he worked on, um, you know, for, you know, and it was equally excited about was the wireless transmission of power. Tesla was one of the early radio pioneers. In fact, he was working on radio before the, even the term radio was defined. Radio as a term comes from about 1904, 1905. But as you can see, Tesla was thinking about the wireless transmission of powers as, as early as the 1890s. And so he's one of the few famous American inventors that contributed not only to electric power, but also to electronic engineering. And he was involved with both power and communications. And as I studied him, I found that he was a great opportunity to think about how disruptive technologies are created without having to basically come up with the standard explanations. Oh, he was a genius. Well, what, is that, what does that mean? How do, are we explaining anything there? Or, oh, he was really lucky. He was the right guy in the right place at the right time. Neither luck nor genius are particularly useful explanations, if you, if you ask me. So Tesla is a serious individual. But at the same time, he is a powerful popular culture. He turns up as a, a, a regular figure in a variety of science fiction stories or in video games or in, in any number of, of forms in the popular media. And in the popular media, you know, he's, he's been regarded as, as a brilliant genius, second or maybe even ahead of Leonardo da Vinci. And some people will say he's the Leonardo of the 20th century. Other people, um, not so not so necessarily enamored with Tesla, would talk about the fact that he was he was he was crazy, and that he was an eccentric dreamer who had great visions but seldom finished anything. And sadly, at the end of his life, he spent his his last days uh, feeding pigeons in the park behind the New York Public Library. And of course, my all time favorite is is this is there's a whole school of thought that says Tesla was actually a space alien, and he came to Earth from the planet Venus on the wings of a giant dove. How can you not resist studying a guy that has that sort of popular, that sort of, that sort of image in popular, in popular culture? But we're not worrying about so much the popular culture. We're worrying about that, that individual who was a true historic figure and who invented really important technologies. Now, what makes Tesla puzzling to me and also intriguing is this is he doesn't fit in any, any single category. He's not just an inventor's inventor, like say Thomas Edison. Indeed, he was an inventor. He worked, his creative domain was the world of technology, the world of electricity. But in many ways, Tesla functioned more like an artist than a scientist. As you'll see tonight, he's more intuitive, he's less experimental. He's, he's an artist in that he wants to think about the meaning, the significance of his creations. And he was a true performer. He liked nothing better than to get up in front of a live audience and deliver just an outstanding lecture with all sorts of demonstrations. And he, he, there are people that said some of the most important lectures that scientists 40 years later said the most important lecture I ever saw was, was one by Tesla. And at the same time, Tesla was not only an inventor, not only an artist, but he was also an entrepreneur. Many people would sort of say, oh, he didn't know anything about business. He was a schmuck when it comes to business. But he actually had a, business, a strategy for how he was going to make money with his inventions. So as a, as a historian, as a biographer, your job is to try to figure out how you're going to weave all of these roles together. How are we going to make sense of this complex character that we call Nikola Tesla? So in, in my book, the, the major two dueling themes are ideal and illusion. And again and again, these are the two things that come up to understand Tesla's style as a creative person, as an inventor. So what do I mean by ideal? Tesla believed that behind every invention, there was a fundamental principle that needed to be found. And if you could figure out what the kind of secret was, and bring it forward and manifest it in your creation, then you would have a big success. At the same time, he, he also was aware that while he could envision this wonderful ideal and develop it in his mind and hone it, other people weren't gonna get it. They were gonna go sort of say, huh? And so he had to figure out a way to engage people 
get them to begin to see the possibilities of the ideal, but always knowing that, that anything he told them would be only an approximation. And that's what I mean by an illusion, that he could always be trying to figure out a metaphor, a story, a demonstration that would capture the audience's imagination and begin to help them see the future that he saw. And that's why the demonstrations and talking to the newspapers were so important to Tesla because he couldn't, he couldn't be sure that anybody was ever going to understand his ideal, but he could share that ideal with them via illusions. But of course, the question is, is did the illusions get ahead of the ideals? So where did Tesla come from? He was born not in, uh, not in Western Europe, like most other uh, famous inventors uh, of the late 19th century. He was born in Southeastern Europe in what's today uh, uh, Croatia, um, next door to Serbia, part of the former Yugoslavia. But at the time Tesla was born, it was part of the Habsburg monarchy or the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Tesla's father was a priest in the Serbian Orthodox Church, which put Tesla's family in a funny situation. They were Serbs, they were Orthodox, like Russian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox, but they were living in a Catholic country, namely Croatia, and they were and and a and and the and the Austrian Empire was largely Catholic. So there was a lot of tension in the world that Tesla grew up in. Now, as a child, um, Tesla had a real problem with with severe nightmares. And these nightmares grew out of the fact that Tesla had a very vivid visual imagination. And as he says in, in his autobiography, he says, if you told me as a kid, um, you know, I've got, you know, so you brought up the word and said, juicy apple, you know, he'd get all excited and in his mind's eye, you know, sort of out there in front of him, he, he'd conjure up this image of a juicy apple. And the problem was, this is he couldn't shake that image. Once you told him something, juicy apple, it was, it was, he was stuck with it. And this was especially problematic with nightmares. So he had just terrible nightmares when he was 9, 10, 11 years old. And there are some other things happening in his family at the same time. But what's interesting with Tesla is, is, is when he makes up his mind to fix something. And this starts when he was a kid. He's going, to, he's going to correct it. He's going to address it. At one point, he was a chain smoker. He figured out how to give up cigars. At one point, when he was like he was completely addicted to coffee he figured out how to give up coffee so when he, he put his mind to it he had incredible willpower and so with these nightmares what he did is, is, is he began to replace the negative images with positive images with trips to elaborate imaginary places which included flying and so as an 11 12 year old fellow he decided that he was going to build a flying machine and it was probably like kind of a you know, sort of combination jet pack, but with a, you know, sort of, you know, kind of helicopter propeller over his head. And he had all sorts of crazy ideas how this thing was going to work. And he puts the thing together. And we have no idea what it looks like. We only have a, this story that I'm telling you. He puts this thing together. And, and the, the piston in the cylinder that's going to drive the propeller moves just a little bit. And he's thrilled. <gasps> oh, my God. You know, I imagined this thing, but it actually works in real life. And that is the thing that drove him as an inventor. He could have these dreams, he could conjure up these alternate universes in his head, but every so often, the things that he built with his hands actually worked. What more, what more powerful motivator do you have as an inventor? That you can move things from your imagination into the real world and they're true, they actually work. Or you seem, they seem to work. And so he was always work, looking, and we'll come back to this story when we, this point, when we get to Colorado Springs in a few slides, he was always looking for things that confirmed what he imagined in his head. So to keep the story moving along here, there's lots of things I could tell you about his childhood and his teenage years and where he went to school and so on and so forth. So he studies engineering in the late 1870s in Graz, Austria. At, at what was then one of the leading leading engineering schools in Europe. Um, and while, while he's, you know, he, and he drops out of school, so boys and girls don't follow that part of Tesla's career. But after the third year, he basically, he basically stopped studying, he lost his scholarship, and, uh, and he started, he basically, you know, started, he, he basically started shooting, shooting pool and paying, paying for himself by becoming an expert billiards player. Yes, it's true, the lights in my office do periodically go off, 
especially they go off when I say something negative about Tesla. Okay. Um, and I can jump up and wave, wave my arms and the lights would come back on, but I'm having too much fun. And so we're going to keep going. So while he's shooting pool and, and working part-time jobs in Budapest, Budapest, Hungary, he has the idea that he's going to make a new and improved motor. And it's going to be based on the ideal of a rotating magnetic field. And I'll tell you what that ideal was in the next slide. He thinks about it and he works on it. He does a ton of mental engineering. He learns all sorts of important things about how to build electrical machines like generators and motors by working for the Edison company in a variety of cities. And in 1886, he basically breaks away from the Edison organization and with the support of some very interesting business partners, a man named Charles Peck and Alfred Brown, he gets to work on developing a new AC motor in a small laboratory that was just off of uh, Wall Street on Liberty Street, just around the corner from where the World Trade Center was. At that little laboratory, Tesla figures out how to make this ideal of a rotating magnetic field work. Now, the only thing that you ever need to know about an electric motor, as far as I'm concerned, is, is this electric motors take advantage of the fact that if you have, you have two magnets and you have a North Pole and a South Pole, those two magnets come together. Remember that from, you know, playing with magnets, you know, I hope you all played with magnets in grade school. Okay, now, but if you had a North Pole and it meets a North Pole, what happens? Those magnets push apart. Okay, same thing, South Pole, South Pole, they push apart. Okay, so the whole point of an electric motor is you have two sets of, mo two sets of magnets and you always want the magnets to have North Poles facing North Poles, South Poles facing South Poles and they push apart and the motor, the motor turns. You set, make one set, of, one set of the magnets static. Yeah, call them the stator. You make one set of, of, of magnets able to rotate. You call them the rotor. Okay. Now, everybody before Tesla, if they were making an electric motor, basically said, the way you do it is you basically change the direction of the magnetic field in the rotor. Okay, in the moving magnets. And that makes the whole motor way more complicated than you ever want to have it to be. Tesla's big insight was to think like a maverick and say, I'm going to change the magnetic field in the stationary magnets, the stator. Okay, and that's how he got his motor to work. If you look at the picture on this slide, you see that there's a big donut like coil, that's the stator. Okay, in the middle is a rectangular thing. That's the rotor, okay? So what happens is, is if you start at 12 o'clock on that donut and you work your way around, the magnetic field would go from, you basically would be oriented first to 12 o'clock, then, then at, at three o'clock, then at six o'clock, then at eight o'clock or nine o'clock and then back again. And that would induce a magnetic field in the opposite direction and cause the rotor to rotate around. This, ladies and gentlemen, ends the first science lesson of the evening. I will get to another one in a little bit, but I'm a great believer that if you're going to talk about inventors, you actually got to talk about how their inventions work. It would, it's not fair to give a lecture on Picasso and never, ever talk about any of the paintings. Same thing is true about an inventor. Okay, so this whole thing, Tesla figures it out in 1887. He's, he's thrilled. He's all excited about it. Now, the problem is is, 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 is he brings in one of his backers, Alfred Brown, one who's more technically minded. And he basically does a demonstration by basically having that donut hooked up to a generator. That's all that other stuff on the right-hand side of this image. And to show that he's solved the problem of making a motor, he takes a tin can, like a tin can that you used to get shoe polish in, okay? And he takes that kind of big fat, tin, that, big, that big tin can, Puts a, puts a thumbtack in the middle so it has a pivot on it, and he fires up the, the electrical circuit, and at the right moment, he drops the tin can into that donut, and the tin can goes, whee! And Tesla's thrilled, and he says, look, I've invented a new improved alternating current motor. Isn't this wonderful? And I, I am sure that his backer, uh, Brown, looks at him and says, you got me out of the office. You dragged me all the way over here to this crummy laboratory to show me a tin can spinning. Isn't that special? And he didn't get any more, you know, and it basically, you know, Tesla was realized he wasn't going to get their attention and he wasn't going to get any more money from his backers. 
So Tesla thinks about this, and Tesla, an important feature is, is this, he has a degree of intellectual courage. Most of us, when, when bad things happen, you know, we kind of tuck our legs, tuck our tails between our legs, and, you know, and we don't volunteer, and we don't do anything again. Not Tesla. So Tesla goes, and he says to his backers, Peck and Brown, and he says, he walks into their office a couple days later, and he says, so you know about the story of Columbus? And they go, yeah, 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 we know the story of Columbus. Well, the story of Columbus was going around at that time was this Columbus couldn't convince Ferdinand and Isabella to give him money to, you know, to basically sail, sail, to, sail to the Indies. And, and Columbus is standing around in the court and, you know, and he's having all these arguments. And so finally one day with all the, all the, court, all the experts in, in, in Isabella's court, he sort of says to, to these guys, these scholastics, he says, can you make an egg stand on end? And, and of course, go, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And so Columbus says, bring me the egg. And so out trots somebody with an egg. And, and Columbus takes a spoon out of his pocket, whacks off the bottom of the egg, stands it up on the table. And he says, next question. Well, Isabella, I, I'm convinced, is looking at this whole thing out of the corner of her eye. She's up on the throne and, you know, and she sees this. And she decides that Columbus is her kind of guy. And she gives him the money for the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Okay, so this is this mythical story about Columbus. So Tesla recounts this whole thing, and, and Peck and Brown go, yeah, 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 so, so what? So if the punchline is, this is Tesla says, if I make the egg stand on end, and I make it spin, will you give me the money to get the patents to develop this invention? And they say, you're on. So Tesla runs home, only in, only in the world of downtown New York, because he managed to buy a copper egg, the next day, Brown and, and Peck, the two backers, come to his, his laboratory, and he basically fires up the donut, which you can see in this diagram. The egg is sitting on top, and as the rotating magnetic field takes form in the coil, it causes the egg to spin and ultimately come up and spin on its, on its, on its long axis. It's at that point that Peck and Brown decide he's the real deal, and they back Tesla to the hilt. But here, the egg of Columbus is a wonderful example of what do we mean by, by an illusion. So as I said, Tesla was, had a business strategy, had an entrepreneur, and he got it from Peck and Brown. And Peck and Brown said, look, you take an invention like this electric motor, and we're going to get you a great set of patents. We're going to publicize it through a series of lectures and demonstrations and stories in, in, the, in the technical press, later on in, in newspapers. Um, and then when, every, when everybody's really in excitement and it has a complete lather, oh my God, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, we're going to sell it to the highest bidder. And in this case, the highest bidder was George Westinghouse, who bought all of the Tesla patents for the alternating current motor and basically used it to develop his alternating current power system. And the contract was so good that Tesla gave Peck and Brown the lion's share of the utilities, excuse me, of the royalties, five-ninths of the profits, because Tesla knew that Peck and Brown had made him a star. So for a few years, Tesla goes and works for Westinghouse in Pittsburgh, but he is, he's quickly bored with the routine engineering. He just, he's just not, this is not what he wants to do. So in 1889, Tesla basically quits Westinghouse and runs off to Paris and goes to the World's Fair there and while he's at the World's Fair, he hangs out with physics graduate students who are going to be working, work, go to, are working with a professor in Germany, Heinrich Hertz. And Tesla finds out that Hertz has figured out how to experimentally detect electromagnetic waves, or what we call radio waves. Tesla thinks, thinks this is great. He doesn't understand the phys all the physics, but he doesn't really care. What he has seen is, 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 is essentially the apparatus that, for which there's the circuit diagram down on the bottom. And when Tesla goes back, he reworks Hertz's circuits and soups them up to create the Tesla coil, which is essentially a high voltage, high frequency transformer. But it is a great generator of electromagnetic waves. So Tesla doesn't want to get involved in all the physics debates that are going on around, around electromagnetic waves. He wants to focus on coming up with a practical application. So he decides that he's going to go into lighting. Why? He decided, discovered that if you took a tube 
with a small amount of a gas like neon in it, and you placed it between the terminals of a Tesla coil, the, the, the tube would light up all by itself. In other words, you didn't need any wires to run from the, from the, you know, from the outlet in the wall to your, your light source. Okay, so all of a sudden you could have wireless lighting. And he demonstrated this in 1891 in one of his, his, his most impressive lectures, which he did in New York City. Um, and you can see what was going to about to have to, this, the scene on the, on, the, um, on the slide shows you Tesla. And he's up there giving this lecture before the electrical engineers. And they're about to turn out the lights. And what will happen is when he turns out the lights is, 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 is these two um, big plates that you see on either side of him are charged up, connected to his Tesla coil. And when the lights go out, those two big white tubes that are in his hand glow brilliantly. Okay, so this whole idea of wireless power just wowed people. And they thought that this was really going to be the next big thing. So Tesla patents it and begins to make plans not only to have wireless, wireless lights, but also wireless motors. He brings in all sorts of people, including Mark Twain, to, to see it in his, in his laboratory in the 1890s. And he does a ton of newspaper interviews. But because it's the middle of a recession in the mid-1890s, the panic of 1893, there are no investors that want to buy his patents or license it. And he can't convince Westinghouse to come back in to do the same thing he did with the motor. So, frustrated, Tesla begins experimenting with a different, whole different approach. And he says, what happens if we transmit power through the Earth? It, now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the second physics lesson of the night. And I apologize, this is the last, well, or maybe there's a, a second half physics lesson, but this is, there's, this is the second physics lesson of the night. Okay, top diagram. This is the way that Marconi and most experimentalists in the 19th century thought radio worked. So you have on, you have on the left-hand side of the screen, you have a transmitter, you have on the right-hand side of the screen, a receiver. Okay, so what happens? The transmitter generates electromagnetic waves, radio waves, they go up to the antenna, they go beep, 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 through the atmosphere, and they meet the antenna on the receiver, okay? And the, 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 the signal comes down through the receiver and you hear music or you hear news or you, you, base, or you hear uh, telegraph signals, Morse code, okay? And the circuit is completed because the receiver and the transmitter both are, are connected to a pipe in the ground and a current flows through the surface of the earth to complete the, to complete the loop. Okay, Tesla said, no, 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 no. He said, the energy that you send up the antenna is going to go in all directions, okay? Every single direction. And only a small percentage of the energy that you send up the antenna will ever get to the antenna on the receiver. So he said, bad idea. He said, what I'm gonna do in order to make a more efficient system is, is I'm gonna pump the energy not up to the antenna, but I'm gonna send it to the, uh, to, the, to the ground plate and I'm basically gonna have undulating electric current waves travel through the surface of the earth from the transmitter to the receiver and I'm gonna have a return go through the atmosphere, okay? So the top image, if you will, the energy travels in a clockwise fashion. In the bottom diagram, the Tesla way of doing things, it travels in an anti-clockwise or counterclockwise direction, okay? Tesla thought this was a great idea. He was convinced to the day he died that this is how radio or radio systems were actually going to work, the bottom diagram. So to test this out, he decides to go in, in the spring of 1900 to Colorado Springs. And there he builds the biggest Tesla coil ever, okay? And the Tesla coil consists, this is gonna be his giant transmitter, is it consists of the, a coil in the middle, okay, which is the, is, is the primary coil with the ball and the, and the lightning sparks coming across from it. And if you look behind, that's Tesla sitting, sitting down there in the chair, calmly reading a book underneath all the sparks, okay? And you see that wall or that fence behind him, that's the secondary coil, and the whole thing is 50 feet in diameter. Now, that's the transmitter, which is pumping energy into the earth. What's the receiver look like? The receiver of Colorado Springs basically sit, consists of a coil sitting out in the middle of a cow pasture, that's Pikes Peak in the background, um, with a little light bulb down there that's, that's, that's glowing. 
as long as Tesla could get one of those light bulbs to glow, he was convinced that he could, if he could do it across a cow pasture, he could do it around the world. This is his notion that all I need is a small amount of confirmatory evidence. Okay. So the idea that he could send the energy through the earth was his ideal. And he then only needed a small amount of evidence to be sure that he was going to do it. And he needed some really cool photographs, of course, like the one you see there, in order to convey to people just how exciting and how powerful his idea was going to be. So the photographs are his illusion. Tesla returns. And I did get a date wrong back there a moment ago. He goes, he goes to Colorado Springs in May of 1899. He leaves in January of 1900. He announces that in, as soon as he gets back to New York from Colorado, that he's going to transmit power and messages across the Atlantic within eight months before the year is out. And to promote his ideas, he publishes a completely crazy article called The Problem of Increasing Human Energy, where he says, I've solved all the problems in industrial society. And he goes on at some length on all sorts of, all sorts of different ideas. He argues for vegetarianism in the article. He does you know, also a whole range of topics. Okay, confident that he is on a roll, he moves into the best hotel in New York City, the Waldorf Astoria. Um, and he starts eating in fine restaurants and hanging out with the night, the best, the be, all the best people in New York. And he really is convinced that if he says all the right things, gets this publicity engine going, then the technology and ultimately the commercial success will follow. Well, the first piece of the commercial six, success follows. And late 1901, he gets a $150,000 loan from the world's most powerful banker, JP Morgan. In return, for 51% of Tesla's patent rights. And Tesla decides to give Morgan the 51%. Morgan says, you gotta sort of secure the loan with some kind of collateral. I don't really care how much, what percentage of the patents you give me, but you gotta give me some percentage, okay? At 51%, as you'll see in a moment, gets Tesla into a ton of trouble, okay? Tesla takes the 150,000, he begins to build a laboratory on the North Shore of Long Island, a place called Warden Cliff. And the building that you see, the tower that you see in the lower photograph, the tower is long since gone, but the building that you see is still there and is being restored by a private foundation as a Tesla museum. The key thing, of course, because you're gonna broadcast energy or pump energy through the ground is not the tower, that's the return. It's the, it's the, top, it's the tunnel, the shaft that you build underneath the tower that is where the technical action takes place. Now, Tesla's not alone in thinking about radio or, or thinking about um, wire, wireless opportunities using electromagnetic waves. His key rival is, is Marconi. And Marconi develops his system by increasing transmission distances incrementally. First across his father's estate outside of Bologna, Bologna Italy, then across a few miles at Stonehenge in England. His, his mother was, was Anglo-Irish, and then across the English Channel. And he keeps going longer and longer, and he begins to show people that there's a real practical possibility for wireless telegraphy. Okay, Marconi made two key business decisions. It's gonna be wireless telegraphy, and I'm going to go into a market where there is no competition, basically ship to shore communications. Now, Marconi gets wind in 1901 that Tes Tesla is basically, you know, on a roll, probably going to succeed. And Marconi says, I've got to be the first to broadcast across the Atlantic. And so in December of 1901, Marconi basically tells his engineers in England, in Cornwall, England, to send a signal every day at a certain time, a certain hour, and he goes to St. John's, Newfoundland, the closest point on, in North America, and he does indeed, Marconi claims that he does indeed hear a Morse code signal in December of 1901. So everybody then gets excited and says, oh, Marconi, Coney has actually been the first to demonstrate a practical way of sending radio messages. And Tesla is then kind of stuck because he's taken $150,000 from JP Morgan and he has nothing to show for it. He's only just now, you know, beginning to build his laboratory in Long Island. So what do you tell 
the richest man in the world or the most powerful financier in the world, um, you know, what's happened with his $150,000 investment? Again, you know, we might put our, our tail between our legs and sort of say, oh, I'm, I'm in trouble now. Tesla has a degree of intellectual courage or as they would say in New York, chutzpah. Okay, and so he writes, Tesla writes to, to Mark, that, you know, you don't, don't worry about Marconi. Marconi, is, Marconi is, a, is, a, is a rank amateur here. We're going to build a world telegraphy system, and here's how it's going to work. We're going to have a, power, a, a few power plants, you know, transmitting stations near major cities, each of which can send messages all over the globe by, trans, by basically pumping these signals into the Earth's crust. Trust, okay, and those those plants we'll get from the, the major city like New York. They're going to get stock quotes. They're going to get telegraph messages. They're going to get fa fax fax messages, and as fast as they come in, we're going to we're going to basically broadcast them through the earth, and everybody around the world will have a small receiver, no bigger than a pocket watch. In other words, he saw a vision where everybody would have their own cell phone. The whole earth is like a brain, as it were, and the capacity of this system is infinite. You see, Mr. Morgan, and this is how he closed his letter, the revolutionary character of this idea, its civilizing potency, its tremendous money-making power. And indeed, I think that it's the important thing about what Tesla is thinking about at this point is as he sees that the 20th century is going to be a century marked by an information revolution. But unlike most of the other people until the, almost the end of the 20th century, the 1980s, 1990s, Tesla is one of the first people to realize it's going to be a personal information revolution. And one of my more uh, favorite illustrations of this is this newspaper story uh, from, the, from a New York paper in 1904. And there's Tesla's tower. And yeah, ideally, people were actually getting the signal through the earth. But, you know, leave that aside. But we see that he has this vision of all sorts of people being able to get information, um, taking advantage of that device that they're going to be carrying around that's no bigger than a pocket watch. You can be out on your, on your yacht, on your sailboat, and get a signal. Uh, you can be uh, off camping and you put your pole in the ground and you can get your news and messages. Or you can be a lady of leisure, which is my favorite one. There in the middle, you just hold up your parasol and you collect the signals that you want and find out what your friends are, are doing back in the big city or, or wherever. Now, Tesla and Morgan, again, had a business strategy. They were going to create a company that was going to manufacture those, devi those receiving devices that were no bigger than a pocket watch, okay? And while they were thinking about that in 1902, 1903, another early inventor of wireless, a man named Lee DeForest, sets up a company and basically sells stock over and over and over again, and then runs off with the money, never builds a network, never actually brings out the technology. As a result, this was a complete scam. DeForest and, and Abraham White, it was a complete stock market scam. As a result, Morgan and other Wall Street financiers, in Tesla's own words, wouldn't touch wireless companies with a 20-foot pole. They just they decided that they were just going to stay away from the whole thing. So 1903, Tesla, Morgan basically says to Tesla, no more money. Okay, you got your $150,000, good luck, do whatever you want to do. If you can bring in some other investors, uh, you know, that will help you develop the company, I'm all for it. But of course, because Morgan still controlled 51% of the patents, he got 51% of the returns. And so other investors sort of said, I'm not coming in on this deal, it's a terrible deal. Okay, you know, you know, you know, he would have been if if, if there had been Shark Tank in that period, they would have, you know, the sharks would have laughed Tesla right off of the show. Okay, Tesla gets more and more upset, sends off angry letters to Morgan. Sometimes he's, oh, please give me the money, I'm so sorry. And then other times he's like, don't you know I'm the smartest guy in the world? I, I'm, you know, I'm the greatest inventor ever. You know, and Morgan, I think, just, you know, he, he has a special file for nutcase letters, and the, the letters go there. At the same time, Tesla learns that his closest friend, 
Richmond P. Hobson, who he's been close to all through, you know, from, from the Spanish-American War of 1898, so for about five or seven years, suddenly decides that he's going to marry Griselda and is going to run for Congress and is no longer going to be Tesla's best buddy, okay? Tesla goes into a depression and ultimately has a nervous breakdown as a result of all of this. And as a result, he never is able to finish working out how Wardenclyffe is going to work. But I guess you'd call this the third and final physics lesson of the evening. You know, how would Wardenclyffe have actually worked? Okay. And to explain the, the possibilities here, I say, you got to ask the question, is the earth like an ocean or a water balloon? So I grew up on the Jersey shore. And of course, as a kid, you know, I, I, you know, basically would want through stones in the ocean on a still, a still morning. And I wanted to know from my dad, would the waves from my stone actually travel all the way across the ocean to Spain? Okay. And that's, and, and the answer in that is, 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 this is no, they wouldn't because over time, basically the, the, the water of the ocean absorbs the media, absorbs the energy. But what if, the ocean, the, the earth is not like an ocean, but it's like a water balloon, okay? And imagine, like you see in the, in the picture marked analogy, the earth is a water balloon and you got a little pump on one side and you pump the, that little pump on regular strokes until you reach the resonant frequency of the vessel, i.e. the balloon, okay? And you're pumping away. And if that works, then with each successive stroke, those little one-way valves that look like lollipops all over the balloon or all over the earth would have energy come spurting out of them, okay? Problem is, is that the earth doesn't work like a water balloon. It actually works like an ocean, okay? So you might pump away and send that energy into the earth's crust, but it's going to dissipate and it's only a small amount of it is ever going to get to each of your successive stations or locations. Now, there are people that still think that Tesla was on to something and that, that you could build a system like this. And, and I just basically sort of say, you know what, guys? God bless you. Keep going. When it works, I'll invest in it. But right now, I'm a historian, and this is, this is as near as I can tell, the best explanation, you know, an explanation that works for me. Tesla never re Tesla does recover from his his nervous breakdown and you know and from the 1900s to the 1940s he works on a variety of inventions in the 1930s he has a brief moment of celebrity when he announces on his on his birthday that year that he has he is in the middle of perfecting a particle beam weapon that can wirelessly shoot down send a beam of, of, of ener an energy beam up against airplanes and bring down the airplanes, okay? Um, and everybody goes, yeah, 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 yeah. But when Tesla dies in 1943, the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover basically says, we're taking no chances. And they essentially seize Tesla's papers um, in New York and they go through all the papers and include the papers are, one of the people that goes through the papers is a man named John Trump who it turns out is indeed one of Donald Trump's uncles, okay? John Trump was an excellent physicist, had a long career at, at MIT. And he quickly concludes on about the, the third day of looking through all of these papers and all of this stuff that Tesla had, had saved up, that there was no practical weapon design, okay? Nonetheless, the papers then are in government custody and nobody can get, get a look at them. And this has just generated endless conspiracy theories. Um, but in the 1950s, the US government, in the interest of hoping to get Tito's Yugoslavia, which was a communist country, aligned more with the West and less with the Soviets, gave the papers back to the people of Yugoslavia. And to this day, they're in, uh, in a, museum, a Tesla museum in Beograd. So let me finish up here. Um, and I appreciate your, your patience with me on, um, on this story. Um, I suggested in the beginning that Tesla was a mix of inventor, entrepreneur, and artist. So to be sure, there is no doubt that he created one major success, the alternating current motor. And he had one bold vision, this idea of wireless power. Um, and he clearly was the first to see and talk about 
that the information revolution of the 20th century, of the, of the 21st century, was not just going to be about business, but it was going to be a personal revolution. He's an entrepreneur in, in, that, in the sense that he, he had a, a, an interesting business strategy, a patent, promote, sell. He'd, that strategy would work just fine uh, with any number of Silicon Valley startups today. Um, and he had an idea that was on the right track, that with wireless power, you sell the receivers and you give the information away for free. But what do cell companies do today? Actually do the reverse. They can, uh, at times, will give you the phone for free, but you got to sign up for the service. Okay, so, you know, an, in, an inversion of Tesla's idea, but his strategy that's, it's, that's in the same ballpark. And he was an artist in the sense that he, like artists, was concerned about the meaning as much as the function of his technologies. What were these things going to mean for society? What kind of culture were we going to have? And like an artist, his inventions came from an inner idea. They came from his, from his heart, from his mind, and he was trying to take those ideas and impose order on the world. So what do I think Tesla would be doing today? I think he'd be focused on a major cultural theme. I think he'd be considering, you know, the issues that individuals have access to vast amounts of information on personal devices. What are the business opportunities there? How can those, how can that, that personal information revolution be improved? And he would be using and leveraging all sorts of ideas from science and from popular culture. I mean, you know, he would be, he'd be out there tweeting with the best of them. And above all, he would nonetheless still be an outsider and he'd be inviting us to dream boldly and think hard. So I'm going to stop there. I thank you for, uh, again, inviting me to, um, to present as part of your, your gala event this year. And uh, I'd be very happy to take some questions. Megan, are you going to kind of manage that for me? Absolutely. Um, we you. have a question. Um, what was the most interesting or shocking thing, in your opinion, that you found out about Tesla during your research? Well, one of the, you know, probably one of the most interesting things is, 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 is as, as uh, some people know, in 1895, um, Tesla's, um, mu uh, excuse me, museum, his laboratory in, in downtown New York City burns to the ground, um, and he loses everything, all of his notes, all of his experimental apparatus, the whole, the whole, you know, the whole nine yards. And he then, he goes into, it's another moment in his life where he goes into, a, he has a serious, Tesla throughout his life struggles with depression, okay? Um, and, and I can't, you can't, I can't, I'm not a psychiatrist, I can't diagnose it any more precisely than that. And so he withdraws. And it appears that he basically, you know, over a couple of months got better because what he would do is give himself electroshocks to basically kind of restart the system. Not that he goes on and, and develops any, you know, electroshock therapy. That, that comes later and it's developed by a different group of people. But he, he basically would go into his laboratory and at the right moment take, you know, take, you know, take a couple thousand volts uh, from his Tesla coil. Um, and, and over time, that seems to have restored his, his, his energy and his joie de vivre. So I think that was one of the like more like, you know, running that story down was, was one of the more interesting things. Excellent. Um, what is the significance of Colorado Springs? Why did he have his laboratory in that particular location? Sure. So, so there are people that are, uh, that are absolutely convinced that there is something special about, um, you know, Colorado Springs from a standpoint of the of the magnetic fields of the earth and all sorts of stuff like that and in fact when I was out there uh, you know working on the project I actually went it's it's where his laboratory now is is was developed as a as a as a suburban neighborhood in Colorado Springs um, and so it's a whole series of kind of you know perfectly kind of Brady Bunch uh, you know uh, you know suburban houses and it turns out that you know that every so often according to the, the neighbors there, they'll wake up one morning, open the big windows, you know, the, the windows in their living room, and there'll be a Volkswagen microbus sitting out parked in where the hippie guy thinks is the exact location. And, you know, is taking some kind of crazy measurements and all of that. 
So that's, that's the mythic side of Colorado Springs. Tesla goes to Colorado Springs because essentially he wants to, he wants to build a pilot plant. He wants to basically scale up and create as big a Tesla coil as he can. He can't do that in New York and he can't necessarily detect the signals that he's pumping into the earth because by then New York City has multiple wired networks that are going to interfere with measuring the signals in the earth. So there's already telephone systems, telegraph systems, and, and, and electric light and power systems. So there's too much, there's, there's too much interference in New York City. So he goes to Colorado Springs so he can actually you know, you know, work on a, if you will, in a, in a, in a from an electric, electromagnetic standpoint, clean environment and figure out what's going on. He's only there an incredibly short period of time. He's, it's only about 10 months. And he never closes his laboratory in New York. It, by the way, despite, uh, you know, what's now, you know, uh, you know, sort of been, you know, kind of, uh, what was illustrated in the Prestige, which has some beautiful images of Tesla at Colorado Springs, the Edison thugs do not come and burn down the the, the you know Tesla's experimental station. And sadly, he doesn't do the the experiment in Colorado Springs where there are two hundred light bulbs in the snow, all lit up wirelessly in the ground. Mm-hmm. He goes there because he can he can he can actually get the confirmatory evidence that he needs that his ideas about wireless power are going to work. I try to keep these answers short, Megan, but, uh, you know, I I, I get carried away. Okay. What else? What else you got for me? Very interesting. Um, Hit me me with another one. (laughs) Did Tesla have much influence in the adoption of AC for power transmission? Absolutely. But not quite in the way that you think. Okay. Um, He provides... It basically, you know, the, the up to before, I always say this, thanks to Edison and before Tesla, what you had is you had electric light, okay? After Tesla, you have electric light and power. And the power is a result of the fact that Tesla develops a very practical commercial AC motor. And Tesla basically delivers the motor and because there's an AC motor or motor that you can have on an AC circuit, all of a sudden you can use electricity for a larger number of applications. And Tesla comes up with that idea, again, he has the vision. It's the Westinghouse engineers that follow up and work out all of the nitty gritty details that lead up to like an installation like Niagara, which was the first big power system that used alternating current. Um, We have a very interesting question from one of our dear friends of the museum. Donna wants to know, is the story true that Tesla fed a particular pigeon late in life that he thought was his wife? That he thought thought was his wife? Yes. Okay. So, so the, 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 the pigeon, all right. So the, the basic story about the pigeons, we have multiple sources that say, yes, he's out there feeding pigeons. Okay, this particular story about this pigeon that he, he basically is completely, you know, in, in enamored with and in love with, and the pigeon sort of looks into his very soul, and so on and so forth, comes from a single source. It comes from, um, uh, you know, the first, well, actually the second biography of Nikola Tesla. There was one that Tesla published with T.C. Martin in the 1890s, again, to promote his own work. But in 1944, man, a, a very good newspaper reporter, John J. O'Neill, um, pu- you know, who knew Tesla, published a, bi- a, a biography of Tesla um, and the pigeon story about this, this pigeon, this pigeon that Tesla has this, you know, incredible emotional relationship with is, 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 is in that particular book. I tended to treat that the stories in that book very carefully. If, if I found another source that basically, uh, particularly from the same time period, like let's say in this case, the 1930s, that you know told me something similar, then I assume that that story had some validity. But I'm very cautious about the, some of the stories because because O'Neill, like anybody, and like any biographer, has got things, he's got a very particular vision of Tesla, and he wants to see Tesla as, as this, this very spiritual, 
almost sort of super, you know, Superman type of character. And the pigeons, the pigeons are, they get wrapped up into this very mystical sort of treatment of Tesla. Um, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm careful of about that story. And I don't mean to disappoint Don. If you love that story, keep loving that story. Um, because it is, it's, it's, it's part of, it's part of the meanings that we have for Tesla. I always say to Tesla, Tesla people, you know, I, I love the stories you have. I know that you enjoy them, but you know, you got to understand that I'm going to, I'm going to do Tesla a little differently, uh, you know, basic, based on the, based on the historic documents and, and sources that I was able to uncover. Don't cry, Donna. Don't cry on me. And we have one last question. Um, sure. How did Tesla's work influence Alexanderson's alternator? Oh boy, we we are we got somebody who really knows their radio. We want to take it easy on you in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, there you got me. That you know, that's it's a very good question. Okay, so um, Tesla's you know, along with the Tesla coil. Okay, Tesla also generated radio waves by developing high speed, high frequency electrical generators that work, that produced alternating currents. Okay, and they were called alternators. Um, and what happens is, 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 is Tesla basically spends a lot of time developing these, these alternators. Um, as as one of the pathways to you know have a good transmitter for um, you know for for wireless power, um, and he basically has an assistant whose name is 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 it'll I uh, hopefully it'll come back to me, um, but he has an assistant. Um, well, it's 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 like Fritz Leonhard, okay, but I, I don't have his name exactly right. And Fritz is is a trained electrical engineer works for Tesla for a brief period, is actually his right-hand guy when Tesla's out in Colorado Springs. Um, and Tesla basically has a, has a major, uh, basically has a, has a blows up at, 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 at Fritz and basically fires him because, if, you know, because Fritz didn't tell him that he actually had a fiance back in Europe. And Tesla was like, yeah, you needed to tell me this. And so anyhow, so Fritz, Fritz leaves. And Fritz basically later goes to work um, developing alternators and shares some of the alternator designs with General Electric and Alexanderson um, basically picks up and develops the ideas for alternators further. And indeed, by World War I, U.S. Navy ships as the source of, of, of basically the source of electrical energy or radio waves that they're going to use are, are Alexander alternators. I apologize. I can't quite remember the guy, the, the the individual's name, but he's the connecting link between Tesla and Alex Anderson. So uh, that was our final question. Uh, thank you so Boy, much. Boy, that was a tough one. I almost, you know, I almost <laughs> lost it on that one. You know, so anyhow, well, we've been a great, great quiz audience. Thank you. So. We really appreciate you taking the time out to uh, good, speak good. with us. Yeah. And um, I see on the screen we have the different versions and editions and where they're available. Yeah, if anyone yeah. would like to grab the book. Yeah, yeah. Um, so on, on Amazon.com now um, there's not only a paperback edition, there's a digital edition, um, and there is also a an audio edition. Um, so uh, so you know so you can have your you can have your Tesla in all sorts of different ways so excellent very good um well thank you guys all again for joining us um we are so pleased to have so much support for the museum in this very challenging time as you can imagine um thank you so much to our event sponsors and all who've contributed participated in these lectures um, if you'd like to lend your support please visit our website at nmih.org um, and clicking on the support tab or the gala banner on the main page. Um, and this video will be available as a recording on our website for uh, future viewing if anyone would like to go back and rewatch a certain part. Um, but thank you, Professor Carlson, so much for your participation and I wish everyone a great evening. And be sure to take advantage of the cocktail festivities that are coming up. You should tell them about that, Megan. Sure, absolutely. On Friday evening, we're going to have a 
lecture on prohibition in the industrial age with historian and author Garrett Peck. On Saturday, we'll be broadcasting a mixology lesson where you can learn about making an old fashioned prohibition era whiskey cocktail uh, along with our whiskey ambassador, Samantha Beadle. Um, and there's lots more. If you go to the website, you can see all our uh, activities and events that we have planned. Keep calm and love Tesla. That's the, that's the whole idea. Thanks, everybody. It's been a pleasure uh, spending this evening with you. Have a great night. Bye now.